So over the next three weeks, I want to talk to you about what does the Bible say about work? How do we have joy at work? And I can safely say that if you think about work, um, practice work, uh, do work the way most the, of the people that you know do think and process, you're doing it contrary to how the Bible says to do it. Right. Most people are not experiencing work as God says it, and because of it, they aren't enjoying it, they aren't blessed by it, and in this country, work and our relationship to it, let's just be honest, it's not, it's not healthy. And so we really, over the last couple of years, have had a reset around work. I want to encourage you to be thoughtful, to receive from God, to be more intentional around work that's glorifying to God and that's a blessing to you. Okay. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, written by the wisest man who's ever lived, Solomon, he asked this simple question, Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 9, what gain has the worker from his toil? What good is work to me? What good is it for me to work this much, this way, for this person, at this office? What good has the worker from his toil? That's our question. I want you to imagine that you go home today and that in your mailbox, even though the post office doesn't work on Sundays, there is a letter. And in that letter, you find out that you have a reclusive uncle that you have never met of whom you are the last living relative. And he has bequeathed to you a fantastic, capital F, fantastic amount of money, life-changing money, change your car, change your house, probably change your name kind of money. <laughs> change your friends. You know what I'm saying. Here's the question. Do you quit your job? Do you quit your job? Now, pre-COVID, this is pre-COVID, 50% of you have already decided that you're quitting your job. You're just debating whether or not you're going to give notice. I'm just gone. I don't exist anymore as far as you peasants know. The other 50 of you are, are going to stay connected for whatever the reason is. But this is the American dream, isn't it? The American dream used to be that you had opportunity, that you had the opportunity to work you had the opportunity to build something. You had the opportunity to provide for those that you loved, and you hoped that what you built provided for you after you were able to work. That used to be the American dream. Now the American dream is cashing out. It's cashing out. The earlier, the better. I want to create something, an app or a platform or a doodad that allows me to stop doing this thing that we call work. The sooner, the better. That's the American dream, to have to work as little as possible for maximum money. Come on, somebody. Rogers Curvin was an entrepreneur who had started six companies. Each of them was profitable. The sixth one was the most profitable. He found himself in a spot where he was able to fulfill that American dream, to cash out. And he started to fantasize about what he would do with the freedom from work, to be able to have more time for his family, more time for soul care, more time to invest in others, more time to have a good time. But before he cashes out, he wisely calls three friends who had already cashed out, who had already done what he was thinking about doing, and he asked them, how's it been since you cashed out? He was surprised to find out that of the three, two of them had been divorced since their cashing out, and that each of them had had what he called a soul crisis, that they were struggling to get up in the morning with any sense of meaning or purpose. He was so shaken by the conversations that he had decided to take 100% stock option to continue to work, but he said, you know what, I'm intrigued by this. So over the next few years, he embarked on a research project. He talked to 36 individuals, aged 30 to 50, all worth between five and $35 million. That's not with a B, that's with an M, but it's still pinky in the air, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> 36 individuals, all of whom had cash-outable money. Nearly all of the 36 were depressed. 33 of the 36 had been divorced since the buyout. Of the 33 who had been divorced and been remarried, the average age of their second partner was 23. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I have so many jokes. 
most of them would get me fired, all right? <clears throat> all of them communicated that they had gone through this cycle of buying incredible amounts of toys and experiences and trips. They eventually found them all empty and boring. They sold everything off only to then be too bored to not rebuy them, and they had gone through several iterations and cycles of this. The thing that was interesting was that of the 36, 12 were Christians, but their experiences were almost identical. Faith was not the determining factor in their experience, meaning that there's something about the impact of work regardless of relationship with Jesus. Now, over the past few years, there's been some debate that has come from the pandemic. People want a different experience at work. We want more flexibility. We want less work. We want it to be more remote. We want it to be at home, more private, less intense, more affluent. There's a shift in where people live, where people work, how people work, who people want to work for and with. We call it quiet quitting, quiet hiring, quiet firing. Added that this massive jump in artificial intelligence, a lot of us should be worried about whether or not our work is going to exist in the next decade. There is a catechismic, seismic shift in the American perspective on work, but ironically, the American dream remains. So here's some important questions. Does work matter? Does work matter? Does it have value in and of itself? Not for what you get from it, just in and of itself. Is work valuable? And then here's where I want to land. Can I have a good life with no work? Can I have a good life with no work? The title of the sermon is The Good Life. Now, whatever your current answers or attitudes are about work, you take it there Monday through Friday. Whatever your view about work, it tells you something about what you believe about this book and its author, God. There's a reason that we did joy before work, because if I had done work and then joy, y'all wouldn't have listened to the joy series. <laughs> but I want to say something that Pastor Todd said at the Better Man conference. He said, if you're looking for frustration at work, it is there. But so is joy. It just depends on what you're looking for just depends on what you're looking for. So I want to give you the theology of work today. I want to say this is what the Bible says, and over the next two weeks we'll unpack it. I want to first give you a wrong view of work, and then I want to give you a biblical theology of work. And as I give you the wrong view, I just want you to not think about it intellectually, but apply it personally, because everybody in this room has influence and probably leanings toward one, if not all three, of these views of work. We are shaped by our culture. We are shaped by the philosophies and practices of our culture, and it's important for us to be able to call it out so that we can apply God's word to it. First of the wrong views of work is just the idea that work is a curse. And people in the church, we, we say that, you know, this is a broken world, the world is sinful, the world is, is divided, and work is just caught up in this. The reason that work is so hard is because the world is so messed up, it's just a curse, it's a necessary evil, I'm going to spend the rest of my life getting up on Monday morning doing this thing that nobody wants to do, it's necessary evil, but we have to do it because I got bills, but it's a curse, number one. Number two is that work is meaningless. Work is meaningless. There's nothing really to it. You're just punching in and punching out. Nobody cares. Nobody's paying attention. There's no significance. There's no value. There's no purpose. There's no joy to be had in it. And well-meaning Christians, sometimes we don't think all work is meaningless. We think only certain work is meaningless. And that's where we come up with this idea of I have a secular job. Tim has a spiritual job. I have a secular job, which means I'm a teacher, or I'm an accountant, or I'm a plumber, or I'm an iron worker, or I'm a whatever you are. If I did what Tim does, or Todd does, then I would be doing significant work, but I'm not doing spiritual work, I'm doing secular work, and for the rest of my life, I'm going to do secular, meaningless work because God cares about the communion table, but not the conference room. Thirdly, is that work is a means to an end. And this is where most American Christians land. That work isn't so much of a big deal. It's really what work gives me so that I can do things that are a big deal. So money 
Four memories, most of them on the weekend, in the fall, as long as Mahomes is our quarterback. <laughs> or the Royals return, too. Okay. Yeah, it's not what I do Monday through Friday, it's what I do Friday night through Saturday night, try to recover so I can show up respectable on Sunday morning at church. Yeah, that's what, that's what my work is for. It's for memories. The other one is, is money is for memories and money is for more. Right? I work so I can have money to get what? I don't know, just more. More, more stuff, more shirts, more experiences, more cars, more houses, more vacations. Right? How much money before you be content? I don't know, just more. How much more? I don't know, just more than I make right now. And it's amazing that we never get to a spot where we say, it's enough. It's just more, which puts us on this doom loop of I'm working for a thing that has a, an, an, a subjective goal that will never get filled. The third is money for when I'm mature, when I retire. When I'm going to retire, I'm not going to do what I don't want to do. I'm not going to have anyone boss me around. I'm going to only do what I want to do, and I hope that I live long enough to spend the money that I made doing the work <laughs> for when I'm mature. Please, God, fix our healthcare system in these United States so that I can spend the money that I made trying to get to the spot where... Okay, so if any of these make sense to you, if you believe any of these, you are likely of the non-notice-giving type. <clears throat> Here's the problem. You are going to spend 150,000 hours of your life doing a thing that you think is a curse, is meaningless, and is for something else. 40% of your life, and I'm not even counting sleeping, you're going to spend doing some type of work. So if you think that work is a curse, if you think that work is pointless, if you think that work is only for Friday night, well, no wonder you struggle with joy. No wonder you struggle with depression. No wonder you hate Monday. No wonder you put all of your effort into planning your vacation. Because you believe things that push you in a direction that's away from work as a blessing. So what is a theology of work? Now, what does the word theology mean? It just simply means the study of God. So we study God to understand work. We study God to understand joy. Once I get a clear view of God, I understand who he is and then what he thinks about work, and I know that if I do it God's way, there's blessing and empowerment there. So in the Bible, there's several ways that you can understand the Bible. Well, one of them is to understand four different movements of Scripture, four different movements of God in Scripture, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. So let's just, let's just go through them. In the beginning, nobody would say that that wasn't the good life. I mean, the, the garden was pretty sweet. No sin. I'm good with God. I'm good with my spouse. I'm good with creation. Everything grows. Everything's easy. There's no shame. There's, there's, there's no conflict. There's no drama. It's just every day is absolute paradise. And in that paradise, God is working. You know, he spoke creation into existence, but when he created you, he stepped down off his throne, got on his hands and knees, scooped up some dirt, and shaped the first man. God's working. And whenever the first man gets created, he looks at the man, says, glad to have you, welcome to paradise, get to work. In the garden, work existed. It was a part of what God was doing. It was a part of who God was. Now, when the fall came around, notice that God doesn't say, ah, oh, y'all messed this up, so work has to go away. No, he says work persists, but now it's going to be hard. Now the things that used to grow are going to come up with thorns and thistles. And as an as a individual with a garden, I can attest the Bible is accurate. Yes, the tomatoes grow. It's amazing what else grows with it. Yes, it used to be easy. Now you're going to sweat. Now you're going to come home stinking and grumpy and worn out. Didn't used to be like that, but that's what sin does, and it always costs you more and takes you further than you thought it was going to. Work exists in creation. Work exists in the fall. In redemption, what do we say? Redemption is about the person and work of Jesus. 
Jesus does a work that you and I can't do. He saves us. It cost him. It was work. And we aren't saved by our work. We're saved by the work of God as he extends grace to us. And once he gives his grace to us, he says, I don't save you by your work. But once I've saved you, I create a good work in you. In Jesus, we don't stop working. We work empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we work not under the ideal of the fall, but under the ideal of the kingdom. But it's work. It's work. And once restoration occurs, Revelation 14 says you're going to rest from your labor, but not from your work. There's a difference between labor and work in the Bible. Work exists in heaven. It existed in the first paradise. It's going to exist in the second paradise. There's no unemployed angels in heaven now, and there will be no unemployed saints then. <laughs> this idea that we have of heaven as a vacation where we turn into chubby angels floating around on clouds, suddenly musicians with harps, and do nothing. That's more of an American dream than a biblical one. Work is a theme all the way through the Bible. And at the center of work is a God who works. Not a God who runs from work or demeans work or condescends to work, but a God who does work and invites his followers to appreciate the work that he does and enter into the work that he does. You cannot read the Bible without understanding this simple idea. A good life is impossible without good work. A good life is impossible without good work. Now, if you're paying attention at all to the culture around, that runs headlong, antithetical, T-boning in the intersection of our beliefs. A good life is impossible without good work. A couple of reasons. Number one, because work provides dignity. Work provides dignity. God hardwired humanity to have and to take dominion. So God creates this garden. He creates man, and he puts man into the garden. He says, I want you to take dominion. I want you to grow things and build things, and where something's acting crazy, I want you to bring order to it. And the work was intended to be fulfilling to the man and to his wife as they did the work that God initiated in them and then through them. Interesting text in Ephesians chapter 4 about thieves. Listen to what it says. Let a thief no longer steal. Most Christians, we stop there. Hey, if you're a thief, stop it. Stop stealing stuff that isn't yours. It's not right. It's wrong. Be warmed and filled. The Bible doesn't stop there. Ephesians 4 and verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. Some translations say good work. Do good work. You want to teach a thief how to not steal? Teach him to work. Give him a job. Why? So that he might have something to share with anyone in need. This is amazing. You want to teach a thief to not steal? Don't tell him to stop. Give him a job. Why? So he can get his hands dirty. So he can walk with his chest out. Why? So he connects his work to generosity. This is for free, but I've talked to a handful of mostly young men who are coming to this church. They find out about it, and they've spent some time in incarceration. I had a guy talk to me a couple weeks ago. He says, I can't find a job. He said, I, I, I go to places that say that they're Christians. They won't even let me in the front door. Before you, before you get judgy about that, I get it. Don't you? I get it. Uh, but we're people of redemption. We're people of redemption. And, uh, and I just want to say that if you're in here today or if you're watching online today and you've spent some time in incarceration, it's not who you are. And God's not done with you. And if you want a job, I'll help you get one. Now, listen to me real carefully. If you're going to be trifling and hustling and acting a fool, don't come see me. But if you say... I used to be, but I want to be, we'll help you. I, I can connect. I'm dead serious. I'll be down here. I'll be down here. 
and I'll connect you. I had a guy come up to me after the first service. He says, I'm, I've got XYZ connections. If you need a job, not a hustle, if you need a job, probably not a job you're going to love, but a job that you can walk around with your chest out. Come on, somebody. Okay? Meet me down front. Meet me down front, and I'm dead serious about that. All right? Why? Because work provides dignity. Work provides dignity. Number two, work provides purpose. God connected his work to our work. The Lutherans say that work is the fingers of God. <laughs> it's the fingers of God. Now, what's interesting about this is that God doesn't give Adam an easy life, does he? Listen, farmers, they work harder than you. <laughs> they do. They don't stop at Starbucks on their way to work. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no. Nah. Farmers come home tired and sunburned. Far farmers work for a living, and Adam was, was a farmer. It's interesting to me that God doesn't put Adam in a nice air-conditioned office. He says, get out to that field and work, son. And you can imagine that Adam, if he knew better, would have been like, for real? You want me to do manual labor? That doesn't sound easy. And I imagine that God would have said, it ain't easy, but it's good. It's good, and it's purposeful, and it's an extension of what I'm doing in the world, son. So part of finding purpose in work, this is really where the rubber meets the road, is understanding the reason that God created work to begin with. You're not going to find purposeful work if you don't know the purpose that God created work for. And then once you understand it, the only way to experience it is to do it God's way. So hear what I'm saying. If you do work the way the rest of your coworkers do work, it is not purposeful. It will not feel purposeful because it isn't. But if you do it God's way, then God's blessing is behind God's purpose. So how or what does God say work intends to do First in you and then through you. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, number one. God says that work intends to serve people. Work isn't you-centered. Work is other-centered. Yes. Now, look, I could go on and on and on about this, but for 90% of us, that is our problem. The reason you're miserable is because you think that you go to work for you. You go to work with an expectation that it's going to feel a certain way, it's going to respond a certain way. You're going to get paid a certain way. And your expectation is premeditated bitterness. You're just going to work with a chip on your shoulder. I know it ain't going to be like that because my boss is above it. Hey, hey, hey. If you're a Christian, work, you ain't going to work for you. You're going to work for others. God saw the dominion of man as flowing from man's relationship to God and then extending horizontally to the creation that he had dominion over. So watch. I receive from God, and I give to others. And as my relationship grows, my dominion grows, and as my dominion grows, the blessing around my dominion grows. Lester DeCoster says that work is the form in which we make ourselves useful to others. Work is the form in which I make myself useful to others. Now, in our culture, hear me, in our culture we have a problem because we have a growing view of the sacredness of the individual. This is the reason that we can't get along because we're so fragile. Hear what I'm saying? The sacredness of me <laughs> means how dare you disagree with me. How dare you not give me what I want? How dare you not be in lockstep with me? How dare you not serve me? How dare you not celebrate me? This is the reason that our country is broken. It has nothing to do with D.C. It has what's, it's about what is going on in our hearts. I need you to celebrate me, and when you don't celebrate me, I am free to attack you. The growing infatuation with the individual that is not commiserate to the growing infatuation to the common good. You only have, you have a limited amount of blessing to give. And when I demand that you give me your blessing, it doesn't go to all of us, it just comes to me. 
This is what's happening right now. Here's the problem, the great command. A lawyer comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, how do I be right with God? And Jesus says, there's two things. Number one, love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And number two is like it. In other words, if you actually have number one, you will have number two. And what is it? Love your neighbor. A lot of Christians run around, say they love God, but they hate their neighbor. And here's what I need you to understand. That's not a thing in the Bible. You can't love God and hate what God loves. No, no, if you love God, you're going to love what God loves, and God loves people. It's sort of like you saying to me, Tim, I like you, your wife I hate. Well, guess what? Now we got to fight. <laughs> A lot of Christians do this. I love Jesus. I just hate the church. No. No. It's not a thing. It's not a thing. So Christians are individuals who understand I am for others. Why? Because of how much I've received. And watch what's happening. This is really interesting. Post-COVID, work is becoming more me-centered and more isolated. Have you noticed this? Now, don't overhear what I'm trying to say to you. But there's this thing that's happening that I really want to try to work how I want, where I want, for how much I want, but for the same amount of cash. So I want to work at home, a limited amount of hours, and I would like a raise. Okay, now, just hear what I'm, hear, here's what I'm saying. Hear what I'm saying. If, if, you can, if you can pull that hustle off, do you, all right? <clears throat> but, but do hear what I'm saying. If, if I were the enemy and I could get all the Christians out of the workforce because they're all working from home, and I'm talking real tangibly right now, I'm going to do it. I get it, you want to work from home. I get it, you want to work less. I get it, we have an unhealthy relationship to work. But I also need you to understand the mission field ain't in your house, it's out there. And if you abandon the mission field for a better work environment for you, just think spiritually about it. Loving my neighbor is more than being kind to my neighbor and mowing my part of the lawn. It's also my contribution to the creative order that is for their benefit. For their benefit. Self-orientation always brings frustration. Listen, when you make it about you, you are setting yourself up to be mad all the time. Because you have an expectation. An expectation that is not shared by your spouse, your kids, or your coworkers. All you are doing is bringing expectations in the assumption that your expectations aren't going to be met. Have you also inversely seen that people who intend to serve tend to be happy? People that are selfish, always frustrated. People that want to be a blessing, always figure out a, a way to be a blessing and then are blessed that they get to be a blessing. The most satisfied people aren't those who don't work. Rather, for those who work to be a blessing to others. The best doctors don't do it for cash. They do it for their patients. The best artists don't do it for art. They do it for the experience you have when you see their art. The best preachers don't do it because they get to talk. They do it because they love their congregation. So connect the dots. How does what you do bless others? I'm an accountant. Do my taxes right. It'll be a blessing. I'm a barista. Can I have my coffee hot? I'm a teacher. Come on, somebody. Don't even get me started. I'm a plumber. <laughs> Unclog my pipes. Fix my septic tank. It's a blessing to me when you do your job. How does what you do, how is it a blessing to others, and how are you a blessing to those you do it with, your coworkers? You will only enjoy your work. Hear me. You will only enjoy your work when you consciously see your work as loving your neighbor. When you think to yourself, tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I get to love my neighbor at an address. Now, you can get up tomorrow morning, you can be grumpy, it's Monday, give me my coffee, oh, this is so stupid, I have to go to work, I hate my job, my boss is a loser. Do it, you can do it. But then don't complain what it doesn't give you. 
Or you can do what Pastor Todd said, and you can say, there's joy at my workplace, there's purpose at my workplace. I'm going to be a blessing to someone today. I just don't know who it is yet. Just try it this week and see if it affects your work. So work that serves others. Number two, work that develops character. Okay. (laughs) Any of y'all have kids? Okay. Do you give your kids chores? Okay. You should give your kids chores. Hey, let me help you. Okay. Get them off the video games. Ain't no dignity in vi- video games. Okay. You should give your kids chores. So I give my kids chores. I've got great kids. Really, I sincerely do. But, but can I tell you, me doing the chores I give them would be way easier if I just did it myself. <laughs> it's unreal. I, if I did them, they'd be done quicker. They'd be done quieter. They'd be done correctly. I mean, it's amazing. Okay. I say to my kids all the time, like, you think I preach here. You pray for my kids. They get a sermon. Um, Son, sis, I, I am not concerned about the chore. I am concerned about your character. I'm not concerned about your comfort. I'm not concerned about the plans that you had for later. I'm concerned about your ability to do a task that is assigned to you with all of your heart, even if it feels meaningless to you. I'm like the farmer who had boys. He was working the boys, and somebody came up and said, you don't have to work those boys so hard to raise that corn. To which the farmer replied, I'm not trying to raise corn. I'm trying to raise boys. Listen, you got to teach your kids to work. If they don't see you work and you don't expect them to work, you're missing out on some character development. Work, and more specifically, um, employment, teaches you faithful stewardship. For me to act like something is mine when it isn't. My kids don't pay my mortgage. My kids didn't buy those dishes. My kids don't, didn't pay for that hardwood floor. Correct. I'm teaching them stewardship. I need you to act like it's yours because one day it will be. One day it will be. There's a parable in... The scripture, Matthew 25, it's the parable of the talents. Master gives servant five talents, two talents, one talent. The one who gets one talent says, I knew that you were a hard man, that you didn't reap just from what you sowed, and so I buried it in the ground. And it's fascinating. The master says to the servant who was not faithful, he doesn't say, I I really wish you had worked harder. What's he say? He says, you're a wicked and slothful servant. He doesn't talk about his work. He talks about his character. When you read the Bible, you see that your ability or inability to do good work is not tied to a skill set. It's tied to your heart. It's tied to your character. Work provides disappointment. That's what it does. Work provides injustice. Work provides success. Work is a teacher. Work provides ethic, integrity, sovereignty, but we don't evaluate it in this. We only look at what it doesn't give us, but listen, God isn't trying to do something to you. He's trying to develop something in you. It isn't about God's work through you. It's about God's work on you. Why do you have the boss that you have? If you believe in the sovereignty of God, it's on purpose. Why'd God give you that boss? who's lazy and a liar. I don't know. You tell me. (laughs) What's God trying to develop in you? What's God trying to give you? Or what is God expecting you to bring that isn't there until you showed up? Some of you think, my workplace is a terrible place to work. Well, it shouldn't be once you get there. What did Dr. Harper say last week? We're peace creators. Where peace isn't, it exists once I arrive. 
Where work ethic isn't, it exists when I arrive. Where truth isn't, it exists when I arrive. Where trust isn't, it exists when I arrive. You are there on purpose if God is sovereign. Now, if God's not sovereign, it's a whole other situation. But if God is sovereign, you aren't there because your job application got accepted. You're there because God intends you to serve others and God intends to develop something in you as you serve others. It's on purpose. And then thirdly is work that aims to glorify God, serves others, develops character, and glorifies God. Glory has to do with essence in the Bible. When it is how it's supposed to be, it creates glory. So watch. When I worship God, hands up, tears streaming down my face, it's as it's supposed to be, and God gets glory. When I stand with my hands in my pocket and a scowl on my face, it is not as it's supposed to be, which is why God doesn't get glory and I don't get the experience from worship of the person standing next to me. Same thing is true of work. Whenever I go to work to serve others, saying I'm clear that my character needs to be developed in certain ways, but I'm aiming to glorify God, I get something from the work that the person who's only there to mooch off the system doesn't get. It's not as it's supposed to be. English essayist, essayist, easy for you to say, Dorothy Sayers in her article, Why Work, rebuked the church for failing to teach people about work. I'm trying to correct it, Dorothy, all right? She said we had failed to teach carpenters when we told them to be moral and with their free time attend church. Rather, we should teach him and tell him, make good tables. Now think about that. A Christian ethic isn't be moral and come to church when the doors are open, even though those things are true. A Christian ethic is if you're a carpenter, make the best tables. If you're a doctor, take the best care of the patients. If you're an accountant, be right. Right? Yeah. Do not use the word audit to me. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Someone was talking to bricklayers, three bricklayers, and asked them what they did for a living. The first said, I lay bricks. Hard job. I did it for a summer, which is why I went to college. Come on, somebody. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Woo! If you're a bricklayer, respect. The second said, I build walls. Oh, wow, a little more vision than the guy who. The third was a Christian. He said, I build cathedrals that invite worship. I'm trying to build the best walls. Why? Because I serve the best God. And you know you can do this with anything. You can do this at any spot. I'm a bagger at Price Chopper. Oh, no, no, no. I'm the best bagger at Price Chopper. I'm on time. I'm respectful. I'm kind to people who come through. I don't put the wrong thing on top of the other so it smashes the buns. You know what I'm saying? I work as unto God, doing the most menial things. And here's what I need you to understand. If you don't do it with the menial things, you won't do it in the corner office. You think you will. You think you'll flip a switch. You won't. You're developing a character now that will keep you from the corner office. Because you keep smashing my buns every time I come in. That was a little weird, but you get what I'm saying. All right? My coffee keeps being cold. My taxes keep being wrong. My plumbing keeps being clogged. My foundation is still askew. My windows are incorrect. You say you're a Christian. Well, I have good theology. No, you don't. You don't. You don't have good theology. Colossians 3, whatever you do, Whatever you do. What I do is pointless. No, it's not. Whatever you do. I make copies. Make great copies. Right? Whatever you do, work heartily. Give your whole heart to it. Can I just say one thing that drives me crazy? I'm going to say it regardless. <laughs> is these kids with the AirPods in at work. <laughs> Have you lost your mind? 
My kids have AirPods. And I've said every time I see a kid, now they're like, I know, Dad. Give your whole heart to it. I, I don't want to see your phone. I don't want to see the AirPod. I don't, oh, hey. I, literally the other day, I went through a deal, and the, the kid's on his thing, like this, and he goes like this, just a second. I was like, Pah. No, I didn't, I didn't, but I wanted to. In my mind, I did, yeah. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that the Lord, for the Lord you will receive an inheritance for your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. What you do matters, but who you do it for matters more. Yeah. Last thing, and, and I'll be in my seat. If you can make paradise, if you can make paradise, what would it be? When God made it, he put work in the middle of it. Which means the further you are from good work, the further you are from God's paradise. God, we love you today. And I thank you for your word. I thank you for your grace. I thank you, Lord, for the work that you have put before us. I thank you for the opportunity that it is to bless the citizens of this great city. Lord, it's difficult. I'm broken. They're broken. Systems are broken. It's corrupt. It's not set up to empower. It's greedy. It's unjust. Lord, we see it. We admit it. But Lord, we believe that you're bigger than it. And we are clear that we, as we heard last week, are your ambassadors to declare a kingdom, to exhibit a kingdom, to bring a kingdom that in many ways shows up through the fingers of God, the work that we do. Lord, I pray blessing over the teachers, over the cops, over the firefighters, the accountants, the plumbers, the factory workers, the bricklayers, the counselors, all of us with influence, all of us with opportunity. But Lord, I, I just pray that you'll call us into repentance in some ways. Maybe we've been struggling with work because we've been making work about us because we've been expecting people to serve us. So would you empower us, give us fresh vision, fresh energy, fresh expectation to bring the gospel, to bring the kingdom, to be a blessing, to see our hearts changed and developed, to bring you glory in a way, Lord, so many of us are uniquely in that place, in that office, at that school, in that neighborhood. Help us, Lord, with the tangible elements of our faith to see you as you are, see ourselves as we are, and to be faithful with the stewardship that you have in front of us. We love you, God. We thank you, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus, all God's people said, amen and amen.